All right, if you love the worship team, let them know one more time with a big hand. You ever had someone try to play a game of gotcha with you, like in a relationship? Like they'll know an answer to a question. Maybe it's something they didn't want you to do, but uh, they think that you don't know, and so they're going to ask you a question, and based off of your answers, they're going to get you. You know what I'm saying? And they already know the answer. They already know what you did, but they're going to ask you to see if you're going to lie to them or something like that. I think a lot of times people have that view of God in their mind. Like I think a lot of people want to come to church on Sunday mornings, but they kind of stay away because they think of God as someone who's going to play gotcha with them. Like they have all this baggage in their life, and God's not really interested in helping you get past it today. He just wants to expose it all. He wants to expose it. He wants you to feel guilty. He wants you to feel bad enough to where you change your ways. And I think some people, when they come to church, there's this hesitation on the inside of them because they view God in that way. But that's not how God is. God's not trying to play got you today. He's not trying to expose you today. He's trying to expose some things to you about your life personally so he can change our life. But deep down, he wants to encourage you today, and he wants to teach you today, and he wants to lift you up today, and he wants to set you free today because he loves you. God loves people, and Jesus died for people, and this includes all people. And then God created you and I as people in his image, which means people, you and I, are the highlight and the prize of his creation, which means God gives grace to his people. And God gives kindness to his people and patience and forgiveness and second chances because God loves his people. But people, you and I, and that includes us, people can be deeply messy and deeply broken. You get a bunch of people together and there's a high possibility for drama, amen? You get anybody together because they're people and there's a high possibility for loneliness and heartbreak and rejection and pain on the inside. People are broken and people are messy. And as people, you and I can go through seasons and in these seasons, you and I can be controlled by our selfishness, our revenge, our pride, and our anger. And then at other times, we have other people in our life like a spouse or a coworker or a friend, someone we go to church with, and those same people can go through seasons in their life when they're not strong at all and they're controlled by their anger, their revenge, their pride, and their selfishness. And so because of that, and remember this this morning, if you're still with me, Sam, I'm still with you. I hope so, because I've only been talking for a few seconds, amen. But anyway, notice this on the screen. We mistreat each other because that's usually easier than restraining the most selfish parts of who we are. Pride is selfish. Anger is selfish. Unforgiveness is selfish. Revenge is selfish. But it's really easy to let all of that come rushing out of us. It's very difficult to restrain the most selfish parts of us, to restrain the pride and to restrain the anger and to restrain this need to retaliate and get people back. And it's a lot di more difficult to love people and love people through those things, but that's why we mistreat each other. When people who are not perfect get involved with other people who are not perfect, sometimes a big mess can happen and people hurt each other. People hurt people. Now, Whenever one or more persons involved in anything, there's always a high possibility for stress, too. Last Sunday night, we had a Bible study up here that I taught at 6 o'clock. And when I got ready to leave my house, I went out and I went to start my truck in my driveway. And it kind of stalled a little bit, but then it started right up. I didn't think much of it. My truck's only four years old. It only has 40,000 miles on it. So I thought, no big deal. It probably just needed to warm up. So I drive to church. We have Bible study. I park my truck, turn it off. An hour and a half later, come outside, get in my truck, starts right up. On the way home, stop at Walgreens to get some juice and popcorn with that, that red hot stuff all over it that me and my wife just love to eat late at night and get it all over our fingers. And my robe, my robe is blue, but it looks like red all over it anyway. It looks like someone bled all over that thing. But I'm not going to wash it because I like the way it smells, amen? And I, don't, and I don't care who else smells it. It's my robe. Anyway, stopped at Walgreens, finished. My truck started right up. We left. Well, the next morning, I woke up at 530, try to get up early sometimes because I'm getting old and I have to use the bathroom, so it wakes me up anyway. But anyway, I, and I said, Tony, you're disciplined. No, I had to pee. That's why I got up. It's 530. But anyway, I thought, well, since I'm up, I'm just going to stay up and get some work done, maybe go to the gym before I have to take my stepson to St. Louis at school at 730. Go out to start my truck. It don't crank at all. But I don't think it's the battery because the lights are working, the radio's working, the inside light's working, the headlights, all that stuff is working. It just won't click. So naturally, I do what you're not supposed to do. I get online and start Googling stuff. Uh, issues with uh, Ram 1500 quad caps. And so, man, everyone's saying that it's the starter, it's the starter, it's the starter. Get it to the dealership. So I would start it, and sometimes it would crank, sometimes it wouldn't, and this just went back and forth all morning until finally I tried one last time, and it started. So I just drove straight to the dealership right here across the street. I didn't make an appointment or anything. I said, man, it may not start again, so I'm going to go. And as I'm going, my engine light comes on. 
So when I finally get to the dealership, they say, Mr. Bork, what's wrong? I said, man, my truck won't start. And so the, man, uh, the mechanics would walk up and they would say, show us. And I would crank it and it'd start right up. <laughs> They'd walk away and I'd try to start. It wouldn't start at all. They'd come back and say, is it still doing that? I said, man, it just started. Let me show you. And I, they'd start right up. They'd walk away and then it wouldn't start at all. And I got to be honest with you, it kind of felt like I was in a relationship with a very painful person. <laughs> and this is what I mean. When I needed my truck to work, it didn't work. And then when I needed it not to work so I could show the mechanics what was wrong so we could deal with the issue and fix the issue, it would work all the time. So basically, it was just not being consistent. When I wanted it to work, it wouldn't work. When I needed it not to work, it would work. And then I started thinking about this. Have you ever been in a painful conflict with someone else and it kind of followed that same pattern? And this is what the pattern looks like. And notice this on the screen. The relationship is just not consistent. When you need peace, there's usually more conflict. And when you try to address the conflict, they'll give you brief moments of peace so you'll forget about the pain that the conflict just caused. You ever been in a situation like that? Man, I need peace. But the reason why I'm not happy is because right now, because of you, I have more tension and conflict in my life than peace. Have you ever been in a relationship like that? That's exhausting. And by the way, most relationships don't break apart because something really bad happened. I've seen couples work through cheating. I've seen couples work through financial issues. I've seen couples work through mistrust. I've never seen couples survive exhaustion. When you're exhausted, most of the time, people just call it quits. And it's not the big things that exhaust you. It's the little things that exhaust you in a relationship. Like when you need peace and there's always tension, always tension, always tension. Someone always finds something wrong. Sometimes I want to ask people, do you ever see the bright side of anything? It seems like you always find something wrong with someone else. And then when they realize that you're quickly getting past your limits and to the end of your rope, they'll start giving you more peace because they know they want you to forget about the conflict that they just caused. But not only do people do that to you, guess what? <laughs> you do that to people too. We're not all victims in here today. Sometimes we're violators too, amen? And, and, and listen, you have people in your life right now that are manipulating, but sometimes you can be manipulating too. A lot of times we're not consistent. And so you and I do the same thing. Again, we have anger and revenge and pride and selfishness in our life. And many times you and I are not consistent with how we deal with it. And so people hurt people. And hurting people always hurt other people. Let me say that again so you catch that, okay? People, because we're all deeply broken and selfish, people hurt people. But hurting people always hurt other people because they're hurting on the inside. When we as people fail to be consistent with our forgiveness, with our love, with our patience, with our kindness and compassion, then we as people hurt other people. Now, this question of how do I recover after someone has deeply hurt me to the point where I can love properly and forgive properly and then set a healthy boundary in my life with those people who have hurt me, this question is very close to my heart because i got to be honest with you, I've had to personally deal with this question. Several years ago, I went through something in my life, and i got to be honest with you, I didn't really see it coming. And my pain was at the hands of, of other people. I was the victim of, of what they did to me. And it caused a lot of anger in my life, and it caused a lot of desires on the inside of me to retaliate, prove a point, get people back, let you know that you hurt me, let other people know that you hurt me. I had all these desires coming in. So I had to ask myself this question because i got to be honest with you. I grew up in church my entire life, and my entire life I only heard churches talk about specific sins that they thought were gross and yucky. And they would call these sins dark and evil. And it was mostly things like, you know, getting drunk and, and getting intoxicated and making stupid choices and being careless sexually and all that kind of stuff. And, and we talked about those specific things, intoxication, as just gross and dark and evil. But i got to be honest with you, we never really talk about unforgiveness as being very dark and very wicked, but it is. But I'll be honest with you about something else. Even before I became a Christian, nothing feels more unholy to me than a grudge. Have you ever just had a grudge and you held on to it and on the inside you knew, man, this feels dark. This is not how I'm supposed to be. I'm not supposed to live this way. Nothing feels more sinful. Nothing feels more wicked to me than holding a grudge and unforgiveness. And so personally, I had to deal with this and ask this question. And anytime someone else in this life deeply hurts you, then you start to deal with these issues. The issues of do I show grace or revenge, love or retaliation, patience or get them back understanding or bitterness and you deal with all these things and I found that in my life right away there's a fine line that I have to walk in this is the fine line and I think that many of you will identify with this this morning if you're still with me say I'm still with you notice this on the screen I really want to offer grace because unforgiveness feels dark but 
I also want to practice some self-respect. I want to forgive, but I also don't want to be taken advantage of. I'm not a doormat. I want to love, but I also need distance from the people who have drained me. And I try to walk this fine line all the time. I really want to give people grace, but I don't want to be a doormat. And I want to have some self-respect. And I don't want people to step on me and walk all over me over and over and hurt me over and over and over again. So there's this desire, because I love Jesus, or at least I try to, to offer grace and forgiveness. But at the same time, God created me in his image, and I want to have some self-respect. And I don't want people to run over me over and over and over again. And this is a fine line to walk. Amen. I want to be humble. I want to forgive. But at the same time, I want to not live like a doormat. I want to be humble and honor Christ. I want to be understanding. But at the same time, I need distance in my life between those people that have hurt me. And honestly, most of the time, right after we have this painful event with someone else in our life, because we're so emotional, sometimes we find it hard to practice forgiveness because emotions mess everything up. Amen? Everyone look right here. Don't ever make a decision while you're emotional in a relationship. Don't ever do that. Because when you're emotional, you don't see things clearly. Even when you think that you do, you do, you do not have clarity because your greed is getting in the way, your jealousy is getting in the way, your anger is getting in the way, your low self-esteem is getting in the way. Emotions always cloud our clarity. And so when we go through pain at the hands of other people, we're always emotional. And then at times, we let our pride get the best of us because our emotions are weak. And the easiest thing to do then is not the right thing, but it's to get people back. Because after all, who would blame us? Our emotions scream loud, get them back. And our closest friends scream even louder, we're not going to blame you if you do get them back. You know how your buddies do. You know how your girls do. Man, get them back. We're not going to hold it against you. And then your emotions scream, get them back. And the whole time, humility in Christ says, restrain yourself. That's the easy thing to do. The easy thing to do is to mistreat people back. The godly thing to do is to love and to forgive. But sometimes, in order to do that, you have to set boundaries. And so this morning, we begin a brand new study on how to love and forgive people who have hurt you. And then how to set a healthy boundary with those people. And this series is called the Trespass Series. Now, the reason why we call it the Trespass Series is because of this. In your life, when you set a boundary, then you have to draw a border. You have to draw a line. And when they cross the line, they're trespassing. And in the Bible, the Bible talks about sins, and that's what you do against God. But the Bible also talks about trespasses, and that's what you do against other people. Other people have this line in their life that doesn't need to be crossed by us. And when you cross those lines, whatever they are, that's trespassing, that's sinning against your brothers and sisters. And so this series is called the Trespass Series. And each week, I want to give you one step to take in order to set a healthy boundary. This morning, we start with the very first step. If you're still with me, Sam, I'm still with you. Now, in the New Testament, the missionary Paul writes a letter to a group of believers in the city called Colossae. The letter is called Colossians. Let me tell you what was going on in this city and in this church. You had some really, really rich people. Now, I don't know a lot of rich people. I don't hang out with rich people because I'm not rich at all. Amen? In fact, my clothes that I'm wearing is probably about 12 years old, but I like them. I think I look pretty cool today. Anyway, but I have known a lot of rich, wealthy people, and some of them are amazing, godly people, godly people. But some of them I hadn't had all that great experiences with. Because the bottom line is they want their profit more than they want your friendship. And if they can use your friendship to get a profit, that's what they'll do. And then when they feel like your friendship's not going to get them a profit, they're done with your friendship. I've had people walk into this church trying to manipulate me that way. <laughs> say, hey, we got all this money to give to the church if you do church the way we want to do church. And I always say, take a hike. You can go start your own church. We're not for sale here. Amen. <laughs> But in this city and in this church, you had very greedy people that were taking advantage of people, business deals that would rip people off. And so naturally, the other believers in this church were hurt, they were wounded, they were deceived, they were mad, they were angry. And then Paul comes along and Paul says something in Colossians chapter 3 to deal with their anger, to deal with their unforgiveness. Basically, he was saying, hey, it, this is on you. I know they have hurt you, but I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to you who really love Jesus. You're going to have to step up and notice what he says, uh, starting in verse 8 in chapter 3. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior. That just means hurtful behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all of its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and becoming like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised or not, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ, Jesus, is all that matters. And he lives in all of us. 
Since God shows you to be his holy people that he loves, you must close yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Put it on like a coat every single day. Take off those old clothes of anger, retaliation, bitterness, pride, selfishness. Every single day you wake up, you wake up with those clothes on, you're going to have to take those off on purpose. And every single day you wake up, you're going to have to put a new life on. And that new life is dictated and dominated by a tender heart and humility and love and forgiveness and mercy. He says, remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Why? Because God forgives you. And above all, clothe yourselves with love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule your hearts. For as members of one body, you're all called to live in peace and always be thankful. Now, anytime we read a passage like this, it's very important not to ask this question. Tony, what does all that mean? Don't ask that question. Ask this question. Tony, what does all that mean for me and for us right now here today? Now, in order to help you understand that, I wrote a paragraph for you. And in just a moment, we're going to put parts of that paragraph up. And if you have a phone or an iPad today, take a picture of this. If you're trying to write notes, try to write really fast, but it, it's a lot. And so what I basically did was I wrote a commentary for you that puts this passage in our language today. And it helps us understand it, and it helps us apply it. So this is what it is, and notice this is on the screen. Notice what Paul says. The best time to deal with your feelings and desires to retaliate is right now. So when someone hurts you and you have these desires to get revenge, Paul says the best time to deal with it is right away. Don't put it off. That's why he says now is the time to get rid of your anger. Now is the time to get rid of your rage and your malicious behavior and your unforgiveness. Get rid of it now. Don't put it off. Then he says this. And stop responding to the hurt that people have caused you like you used to before you developed a relationship with Jesus. So Tony, what does that mean? It means stop acting like someone who's not a Christian when someone hurts you and you feel like you're justified because someone hurts you. Stop, at, yeah, go ahead, give it up. That's pretty good. <laughs> stop responding like you did before Jesus. We do that all the time as Christians. Someone hurts us and our initial response is the way we used to before we even knew who God was. Paul says, that's your old life. Don't respond that way anymore. Respond like a Jesus follower. That's why he says, don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off the old and you've put on the new, your new nature. You also cannot expect God to forgive you if you don't want forgiveness for those who've hurt you. Jesus is their God too. Jesus loves the people who hurt you, just like he still loves you when you mess up. Amen? You know, I think a lot of people in church feel like God, they're, they're, they're God's favorite. Well, I, I know God loves everybody, but I mean, you know, I, I'm a, I mean, you know, I, I go to church all the time, so God, I'm, a, I'm God's favorite. I read, an, I read my Bible an hour a day. I, I'm, I'm God's favorite. And that never becomes more clear than when someone else does you wrong, and the first thing that comes to your mind is, I hope God gets them for what they did to me. Now, none of us would admit that, but you and I think that all the time. Man, I hope they get a flat tire today. God, I mean, come on, God, show them. They hurt me. And the whole time I feel like Jesus is saying, you hurt me all the time, and I forgive you. How dare you not want me to forgive them? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that God's not racist, that God's not prejudiced, and that God has no favorites. Aren't we glad that God's not racist like some of us in here today? Aren't we glad that God doesn't show favorites like some of us in here today? No favoritism. So you can't expect God to forgive you if you don't want God to forgive the people that hurt you. That's why he says it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, barbaric or civilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters because he is everyone's God. Amen. And then it says this, God's people are called to something higher, a life of consistent humility, consistent peace with all people, consistent patience, consistent kindness, consistent forgiveness. We understand that people have faults because we have our own, and so we forgive others because God has forgiven us. People ask me all the time, Tony, how? And this is very sincere. Tony, how? People ask me after the first service, how do I forgive? I am hurt how do I let go? How do I get past this? How do I get past these emotions and these feelings? How do I let this go and forgive? And the simple answer is this, practice consistent humility. Practice consistent humility. One of my friends who comes to this church uh, checked in last Sunday, and he put this as his prayer before the service started. He said, Father, may I be as humble as I possibly can be today. And that really should be our prayer every single day. 
Every single day we wake up, we should pray, God, may I be as humble as I possibly can be today. And this is a great way to understand humility. This is a great definition in how to apply it. This is what C.S. Lewis said about humility. Notice this on the screen. If you're still with me, say, I'm still with you. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Why? Because you were created in the image of God. Humility is simply thinking of yourself less or thinking less of your selfishness. You and I usually have a hard time forgiving because we're extremely selfish and self-centered, aren't we? But true freedom happens when we can humble ourselves. And let me just tell you this. Just because you love and forgive someone else doesn't mean that you have to let them close to you again. Forgiveness and love doesn't mean you have to let them close to you again. And so sometimes you have to set a boundary. Sometimes you have to draw a line so you can love them properly. And so you can forgive them properly. And then once you set a boundary, once you've had a border, once you draw a line, they can't cross the line because if you let them cross the line, now they're trespassing and they're going to steal health from your soul and they're going to steal love from your soul and they're going to steal humility from your life and they're going to steal faith from your life and they're going to hurt you over and over and over again. And so sometimes it's good and godly to draw a line and set a boundary sometimes. Amen. Now, under yeah, go ahead. Give it up. I think that's pretty good. Now, understanding all that, here's a few things I want you to take home with you today. The first thing is this on the screen. When you set a boundary with another person, you will be misunderstood. And this is why. Setting a boundary is like drawing a line around certain parts of your life. Not every part of your life, but around certain parts of your life. And you can let people come up to that line, but you can't ever let them cross that line. And every time you do that, those people are always going to take that as a rejection of them. But just because you set a boundary doesn't mean you're rejecting them. Setting a boundary is actually helping you forgive them and love them in a more proper way and in a more clear way. Let me say this. When you set a boundary, you love them and forgive them, but they're not allowed to drop by your house anymore unannounced. Why? Because it takes emotions away from your soul. It steals health from your life. You're going to wait to answer their phone calls or text messages three days later. You're not going to jump every time they want you to jump. You unfollow them on social media now. You can have brief civil interactions with them, but you cannot be friendly with them and you cannot hang out with them. And the reason why is this, because if you let them cross that line, they're going to hurt you over and over and over again. And also so you can create some space and distance so they can get the picture that they need to back off from you. Now, anytime you do that, you're going to be misunderstood and they're going to take that as you rejecting them. But here's the deal. If you don't set a line... They're going to take you past your limits. And every time they take you past your limits, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to blow up on them. And you're not going to practice humility. And you're not going to practice love. And so anytime you do that, this is kind of what happens to people. You all of a sudden start to see their selfishness and their manipulation. And that gives you another indication that you need to set a boundary with these people. Several years ago, Jackie, my wife, had to do that with someone in her life. It was actually a relative. And this person had hurt my wife, Jackie, over and over and over again her entire life. It was always very non-consistent. Sometimes it was good. Sometimes it was painful. There was lies. There was manipulation over and over and over again. Then a few years ago, this person did the same thing to Jackie and also to me. And Jackie had enough. And so Jackie told this person, a member of her family, she said, hey, you know what? I love you. Forgive you. You can't come over anymore. I got to think about my son and my stepson and my husband and my mom and dad right now. And so no more contact. I'm not answering your Facebook messages. I'm not answering your emails. I don't want to talk to you on the phone. I love you and I forgive you, but I have to think about the health of my soul. I have to think about the health of my family's soul. I have to think about our stress levels and what stress does to us. And now every time I let you close, it's nothing but drama and it's nothing but stress. I love you and I forgive you, but you can't cross these lines anymore. And that person misunderstood and took that as a rejection of them. But it wasn't rejection at all. It was simply Jackie trying to protect the health of our emotions and the health of our souls from a very toxic person who doesn't know how to draw lines and who doesn't know how to stay away from boundaries. They cross those boundaries and they cross those lines every single time if you let them. Amen? And so sometimes they take that as rejection, but that's just you trying to love them and forgive them properly because if you get close to them, your anger is going to fall out on top of their head. Amen? <laughs> so a boundary helps with that. The second thing is this. If you're still with me, I'm still with you. You'll struggle with setting boundaries if you struggle, if you struggle with your self-worth. Remember, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking less of your selfishness. Everyone look right here. You were created in God's image. God does not want you to be manipulated. He doesn't want you to be a doormat. Have some respect for yourself. 
And don't let people run over you and hurt you over and over and over again. Love them, forgive them from a distance, but draw a line and they can't ever cross that line again so you can protect the health of your soul. Amen? Number three on the screen, be consistent. Say, Tony, what does that mean? It means when you set a boundary and you draw a line, don't let them cross that line a month later because you think they're doing better. Keep it. Let them get the picture. Let them understand that when they get close to you, they bring heartache to your life, and they can't do that right now. So be consistent. When you set a boundary, stick to your guns. And the fourth and last thing is this. You're still with me, Sam. So still with you. Know your limits with other people. And this is really the heart of it today. So this is the first step that I want to give you in this series to setting a healthy boundary. And the first step is know your limits with other people. Not only does humility tell us to forgive and love those who've hurt us, but humility also leads us to evaluate ourselves and to admit that I have limits in my life. And if I let people constantly take me to my limits and past my limits, then I can't love them properly and I can't forgive them properly because I'm going to retaliate. Why? Because I've reached my limit and I've been taken past my limits. And so when you're setting a boundary in this life, the first step you have to take is you have to know your limits with people. Now, everyone look right here. Some of your limits may be greater with some people than they are with other people. I know my limits with certain people and, and some of my limits aren't much at all. Amen. <laughs> And so sometimes I have to stay really far away from people, and I can love them from over here. And I can forgive them from over here. But I don't want to hang out. I don't want to sit down and have a discussion. Y'all watch these reality shows on TV? And then they have reunions like Southern Charm and Real Housewives of New York. And all. Listen, we love all the Real Housewives. Atlanta, that stuff's funny, man. I love that kind of stuff. It's hilarious. Uh, if you're under 15, forget I said that. But anyway, it's a great show. But, man, they always have these reunions where, where they're going to sit down, they're going to talk to each other, and they're going to they're gonna talk it out. And what it is is a bunch of toxic people who've hurt each other. Well, I don't want to talk it out with those types of people. I want to love them and forgive them. But in order to do that, i got to get away from you. Because if I stay close to you, you're going to hurt me again. I'm going to get mad again. Amen? That's what a boundary's for. And so we have to know our limits. So remember this this morning. You're still with me, Sam? So still with you. Setting boundaries is essential to love and forgiveness because revenge and unforgiveness is what usually comes rushing out of us when we let someone take us to and past our limits. And so the first step today to setting a healthy boundary is to know your limits. Now, if you're wondering this, Tony, how do I let go of my hurt? How do I deal with my past pain? How do I deal with my heartache at the hands of other people? How do I let go of all this pain and all this revenge and this desire to retaliate? The first thing is this, you got to be humble. The second thing is this, you're going to have to set a boundary. And in order to set a boundary, you're going to have to know your limits. I got my driver's license in 1990. I turned 15 years old in 1990. Back then, you got your license when you were 15 years old. I turned 15 one day. I got my license the next day. The next day, my parents gave me a little red Ford Ranger. It looked kind of like this on the screen. Almost identical. It was a 1985 red and silver Ford Ranger that I drove around De Quincey. And I, I cruised the strip. And so anyway, it was really easy to drive for a then 15-year-old because it was an automatic, and so it was a really cool truck. And I had that truck, I guess, for about a year and a half. And the last two months that I had it, I noticed that one of my gauges, which was my temperature gauge that I didn't know at the time, was, was running on H. Now, at the time, I just thought that that meant high. So, you know, like I didn't know what this gauge was for. Maybe it was my washer fluid, so whatever it is, I got a lot of it. I mean, it's high. It's running high. Just like my gas tank is full, this is full, whatever it is. I didn't know that the H meant hot, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so for two months, I'm running this thing on hot. My engine in the red, I didn't know that. I just thought, man, whatever it is, it's high, cool. And so one Wednesday night after youth group service, I'm bringing one of my friends home who lived about 10 minutes away from my house in between De Quincey and Ragley. And I don't know if you've ever traveled that highway in between De Quincey and Ragley at night. There's nothing out there but Freddy Krueger and serial killers, and there's, <laughs> there's weird animals, and there's panthers, and if you break, there's no street lights. And this was back in the 90s, so we had no cell phones. We only had beepers, and beepers were only carried by people who sold crack back then, and so I didn't have one of those. <laughs> And so, man, if you break down back then, no one's coming to get you because they can't hear you screaming. But you're going to scream because you're going to hear weird noises, and there's going to be weird people come out of them woods. My De Quincey folks know the people that live in the woods in De Quincey don't want to be bothered. That's why they live in the woods. And so if you get close to their trails, they're going to shoot you. You're going to run from buckshot, and they'll ask questions later. Listen, you, and I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating either. We drag the river all the time looking for bodies. That's true stuff. And so, man, you won't break down. It's scary. So, man, I'm cruising, trying to bring one of my friends home, and then my truck starts to slow down, and I see smoke coming out from underneath my hood. 
And then I keep going, so naturally I think, well, maybe I need to press the gas more. <laughs> you know how 16-year-olds think. They don't. So anyway, man, I hit it more, and so it sputters, and then I see flames coming out from underneath my hood. Then I hear an explosion come out from underneath my hood, and then fluid goes everywhere, and my radiator just explodes, and my engine cracks, and that little amazing Ford Ranger that I love so much died right there on that highway. I said, Tony, why? What'd you do? I blew up the freaking engine. I said, Tony, why? Because I was running it in the red past its limit. Everyone look right here. In your soul, there's an engine. And if you keep going past your limits with people, because you have limits, and if you keep letting people take you past your limits, you're going to respond in a way that does not honor Jesus Christ at all. And so the first step in setting a healthy boundary with someone who has hurt you is know your limits. Once you realize your limits, draw a line and do not let them trespass. Do not let them cross that line. Now, here's the deal. When you do that, when you do that, that means that you're not going to get close enough for them to hurt you again. Because if they hurt you again, you're going to get angry again. And you're not going to forgive them. And so if you really want to forgive someone and love someone, know your limits, draw a line, don't let them cross that line, and now you both can start to heal because now you have space to heal, and then you can love and forgive. Amen? So the first step is to know your limits. This is the second step. If you're ready for it, say, I'm ready. I'm going to tell you next Sunday, so you got to come back. Amen? All right, bow your heads this morning. <laughs>